Um, but before we do that, I'm going to pass it to Mike Lynn. Do you have anything to say? Oh, thank you. We'll start the public comment period. And um, following that, we will revisit the voting slides. Thank you. Again, public comment should be limited to three minutes. We ask that you clearly state your name and organization for the record before providing your comment. Please note that the public comment period is not a question and answer session. I would like to introduce our Zoom coordinator, Angela, who will be managing the public comments. Our first commentator is Yanir Bar-Yam. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Yanir Baryam. I am president of the New England Complex Systems Institute, co-founder of the World Health Network. I'm here not to address HICPAC directly, but to speak to those listening, healthcare professionals, patients, and advocates who are committed to public health and safety. Let me highlight several critical concerns. Members of HICPAC and the organizations they represent have significant financial conflicts of interest. This issue, documented a complaint submitted to the HHS Office of Inspector General, raises serious questions about the integrity of their guidance. Additionally, HICPAC has operated in secrecy, with workgroup meetings closed to the public scrutiny. This violates the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which mandates transparency. Such closed-door decisions erode trust and undermine accountability. HICPAC also lacks the legally required number of voting members, further undermining the legitimacy of its recommendations and decision-making process. Most importantly, the science of airborne transmission, essential for understanding diseases like COVID-19 and tuberculosis, is glaringly absent from HICPAC's guidance. Ignoring this science compromises the safety of both patients and healthcare workers. Compounding this issue, the voting members of HICPAC lack the necessary expertise in airborne transmission. While they may consider themselves infection control experts, their opinions on this critical topic cannot be treated as expert input. Science must drive policy. It provides the essential necessary evidence for informed decisions about safety and prevention. When science is sidelines, life are put at risk. One actionable step is for CMS to add COVID-19 and other airborne infections to the list of healthcare acquired infections for which treatment is not reimbursed. This would align with existing policies and create a powerful incentive for hospitals to implement necessary precautions. Far too many have suffered illness required in, acquired in healthcare, become disabled with long COVID or died from preventable infections. Far too many have avoided necessary care due to these risks. Every preventable case is a tragedy and a failure of the system. Please call the HHS Office of Inspector General and ask them to investigate our complaint against the HHS Secretary, CDC Director, and HICPAC designated federal officer for gross misconduct regarding HICPAC's violation of the law. The Inspector General's office is very receptive. The direct phone number is 202-619-3148, 202-619-3148. The HHS Inspector General, Christy Grimm, operates independently of political administrations her office will continue to oversee investigations regardless of the change in leadership. It's time to restore first do no harm. Every provider, institution, and policymaker must prioritize safety based on the best available science. Anything less is a disservice to those who trust the healthcare system with their lives. Thank you, Yanir, for your comment. We can move on to the next one. Our next commentator is Jamie Locastro. Jamie, are you on the call? Mm -hmm. Our next commentator is Michelle Vo. Hello. Good morning. My name is Michelle Vo. I am a registered nurse and president for the California Nurses Association, National Nurses Organizing Committee, a state affiliate of National Nurses United. NNU is the largest labor union and professional association for registered nurses in the U.S. 
NNU commends the CDC for responding to our concerns about HICPAC's process to update the 2007 isolation precautions guidance, including by ensuring HICPAC hears from the public prior to voting, posting meeting recordings, adding additional experts to HICPAC and its isolation precautions guidance guideline work group, and most recently ensuring that both oral and written public comments are solicited for each meeting as required by law. We commend the CDC for sending back HICPAC's November 2023 draft updates for further work in response to some of our core concerns. I strongly encourage you to ensure that HICPAC's response recognizes the following. As the World Health Organization acknowledged earlier this year, the droplet airborne paradigm has been disproven. Extensive research indicates that aerosol or inhalation transmission can occur at both short and long distances. CDC guidance must recognize this science, including recommending that multiple layers of protections are necessary to prevent transmission in healthcare settings, including ventilation, screening, isolation, PPE, contact tracing, masks for source control, and more. Respirators are essential. Yet, preliminary results from NNU's infectious disease survey found that less than two-thirds of RNs have access to a sufficient supply of N95s or other kinds of respirators on their units. Nurses and other healthcare workers must be able to utilize N95s or more protective respirators when and where we need them. Because we assess that we need a higher level of protection than is recommended, because we or someone we live with or care for is at higher risk of severe outcomes if infected, it would be deadly and irresponsible for healthcare employers and the CDC to deny us access to the PPE we need to care for our patients safely. Working as a nurse in a clinic setting for 26 years, I have witnessed so many infections, hospitalizations, and even deaths that could have been prevented if we had had access to the necessary precautions. Moving forward, it is essential that the CDC continues to expand the perspectives represented on HICPAC and its work groups to ensure that a balance is created that includes direct care healthcare workers, unions, patients, and scientific experts in addition to infection prevention management. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We can move on to our next commenter. Vassar Bailey. Hello. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I'm Vassar Bailey. I'm a person with long COVID and an activist with Long COVID Action Project known as LCAP. LCAP is a nonpartisan, diverse group of individuals taking action to end the long COVID crisis. We demand urgent treatment and support for the long COVID community through public awareness and government accountability. I've had long COVID since my first infection in 2022. I caught Omicron even though I was vaccinated and masking. I wore a surgical mask because I didn't know respirators offered stronger protection. I'm not unique. According to NIH data, approximately 10% of the population, that's 33 million Americans, are living with long COVID. Currently, there are zero effective treatments for long COVID. Since HICPAC is aware of the transmissibility of COVID, even during asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic illness, why haven't you mandated respirators be worn in medical settings at all times? One-way protection is not enough. People have caught COVID from medical appointments wearing, despite wearing N95s and eye protection. One friend has caught COVID four times from medical visits despite wearing an N95. Her care providers either refused to mask or would only wear a surgical mask. Patients are frequently met with hostility by healthcare workers if we ask for respirator use during appointments. Problems like this start at the top. Everyone has seen photos of the CDC director visiting various healthcare settings without any PPE. COVID transmission has occurred in rooms that have been unoccupied for four or more hours. Medical offices and hospitals are now one of the best places to catch an illness. NIOSH clearly states that respirators should be used, not flimsy surgical masks. 
We need N95s or better to be worn at all times by all who can in healthcare facilities. CDC's infection control guidance for SARS-CoV-2 does nothing but confuse. That's easily fixed simply by setting forth two rules. One, everyone in healthcare settings must wear a respirator, and two, facilities must clean the air. Numerous studies have demonstrated correlations between COVID and subsequent diseases. The virus remains in the body for most people with long COVID as proven in studies showing viral persistence alongside continuing health problems, the most alarming of which are immune changes. T cell dysfunction is occurring in more and more patients. This is now being referred to by the World Health Network as COVIDs. We're in the fifth year of the pandemic and protections have become more lax. Your mandate is to first do no harm. LCAP is watching. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We can move on to our next commenter. Eric Stein. Hello? We can hear you. I'm Eric Stein and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I've had less access to healthcare for the last four years, starkly less, because CDC infection control standards are insufficient. The absence of unambiguously pro-respirator guidance means patients like me get pressured to remove our masks inappropriately and ignorant questions from healthcare workers on why I wear a respirator. I have the privilege to have diagnoses and know I'm high risk for COVID complications. Plenty of people lack a diagnosis but have an underlying high-risk condition. Should they be placed at high risk? There's constant pressure to senselessly unmask coming from healthcare workers who may have a COVID infection. The less privilege someone has, the more compliant they will feel they must be. Every infection with COVID comes with the risk of long-term complications, even for healthy people. These are the equity issues at hand. CDC's standard precautions already say to use PPE whenever there is an expectation of possible exposure to an infectious material. The significant possibility of aerosol transmission from patients or staff, even without symptoms in the ongoing pandemic, makes this true always. Now this committee is considering moving us further in the wrong direction. Many pathogens spread by aerosols, in particular SARS-CoV-2, measles, flu, and many others. There's a reason CDC is the parent org of NIOSH, which sets PPE standards. Surgical or procedure masks are not rated for airborne particulate contaminants. Everyone here knows this. So why discard respirator use, a common sense precaution to address this major transmission pathway of the most consequential pathogens we face every day? Dr. Fauci was right when he said, quote, bottom line, there's much more aerosol than we thought, unquote. People go to hospitals, pharmacies, and other facilities because they trust it will benefit their health, not harm it. The cited evidence in the draft isolation work group slides is a mixed bag. For instance, Rodinovich et al. 2019 was clearly a poor study design. It uses a six feet guideline, which is nonsense for an aerosol spreading pathogen like flu. Aerosolized virus doesn't die at a magical six foot distance. Respirators provide a much higher level of protection and source control than surgical or procedure masks when actually used appropriately. The evidence for that is clear if you set aside the many problematic comparison studies that undermine respirator performance by implying it's fine to remove respirators in many known risky spaces. To separate the same pathogen into pandemic phase for special precautions and seasonal in the false dichotomy, we don't stop wearing seatbelts when car accidents go down. Just because E. coli has been here forever doesn't mean we take risks with it. We do food recalls if an average 70 people fall ill. Far more people have fallen ill and indeed died because of ongoing use of, in essence, crisis standards of infection control. Long-term practices should be safer, not even more unsafe. There is no shortage of respirators and hasn't been in years. Only a grim calculus that subsumes health to short-term profits and the comfort of people who believe themselves to be low risk can explain the impetus to accept high transmission risk. We need a full reckoning with the risks in a layered system of controls, including ventilation, respiratory PPE at all times, case tracking and tracing, et cetera. Patients like me need progress. We need you to make healthcare a safe, accessible fixture of our lives, not a grim risk calculus we must live with. Thank you for your comment, Eric. We can move on to our next commenter. Artis Smith. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. My name is Artis Smith and I advocate with the disability organization Panendic. Please employ guidelines that protect patients from infection and the work of both work groups. I cannot emphasize enough the sheer difficulty it is as an immunocompromised patient to try to access healthcare, set up disability accommodations, including masks or N95 wearing by providers, and share common spaces with patients who are visibly sick and not masking. 
Source control should be recommended at all times in healthcare and N95s used. Please choose narrative B for questions four, one, and two. With the proposal to weaken healthcare worker isolation, HICPAC is making it much more difficult for patients to access care. Patients should not have to worry whether their provider is infectious. Many workers deny masking requests from patients, which emphasizes that a short isolation period and then source control will not be followed by many. It is important to make policy for the most at-risk patients in order to protect all patients. For example, imagine suggesting, which this change does, that it's okay for a still infectious provider in a surgical mask to meet with a cancer patient. From the slides presented yesterday, it was written that at least 80% of transmissions are estimated to have occurred by end of day five. But this means that HICPAC is saying it's acceptable for up to 20% of workers, or one in five, to return infectious, a high rate of HAI exposure. This committee is meant to advise on best practices for infection control. It is outside of its mandate to advise based on staffing issues. These guidelines will increase staff absences and levels of long COVID and decrease paid sick leave. They will contribute to higher levels of HAIs, serious illness, and death for patients. Studies show that patients who get COVID-19 in healthcare die at a higher rate. A more precautionary period of isolation is needed because workers who may be infectious have a higher risk of injuring patients. The committee should instead adopt recommendations shown to reduce staffing in HAIs. Studies show that universal staff use of N95s reduces sick days and saves hospitals money. It is also essential for language to explain that providers are responsible for accommodations like wearing N95s and explicitly recommend that hospitals make N95s plentifully available for workers to use. The healthcare personnel recommendations also do not describe source control type. N95 should be required through day 10. It is clear that patients' needs and comments are not being represented in HICPAC. From a May workgroup meeting, a meeting summary says, a discussion ensued on whether all the key stakeholders are included. Members express that as clinicians working in various healthcare settings, they do represent patient interests. This statement is concerning. Clinicians and healthcare systems do not adequately represent patients, as has been seen from the committee's recent discussions. HICPAC should add representation from a patient advocate and from a disability organization to ensure that infection control issues for patients, not just workers, are considered because patients have been asking HICPAC for better infection control approaches for a long time. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll move on to our next commenter. McLean White. Hi, my name is McLean White. Uh, last year, I started a community group in my city for people who are still taking COVID precautions mostly people who are immunocompromised or have a high risk condition or have long COVID like myself. I just wanna share some of the risk calculations we make when considering whether or not to get healthcare. When people have to go in for procedures that require the patient to be unmasked, they're relying on their healthcare providers to mask to protect them, but they usually have to be asked to wear a mask and sometimes they refuse. So we have to weigh whether that procedure is worth the risk of an infection. And a lot of the time, people decide it's not. People who live with high-risk loved ones have to weigh whether getting their own health care is worth the risk of bringing COVID home to someone on chemo or on another immunosuppressive medication who would have to stop that treatment if they got an infection. This is not the way that it should be. Patients shouldn't have to make these risk calculations because public health has failed at infection control. Hospitals shouldn't be a main source of COVID infections that hospitalize people. Voting against recommending N95 respirators for all pathogens spread by air will be going backwards and will show that you have learned nothing from the COVID pandemic. It's shameful that there's apparently only one person on this committee who believes that people should be able to safely access healthcare. Thank you for your comment. And um, we can move on to our next commenter. Kate Nyan. I'm Kate Nyan. I'm a public health librarian at Yale University, but I am not speaking on behalf of my employer. I'm also a board member of the nonprofit Community Access to Ventilation Information. I am likewise not speaking on their behalf. I'm also a caregiver. I'd like to thank HICPAC members in advance for considering my public comment, which is relevant to both the isolation precautions guideline workgroup 
and the Healthcare Personnel Guideline Workgroup. First, as a medical librarian and evidence synthesist, I'd like to comment on the meta-analysis produced last fall on healthcare personnel use of N95 respirators. The conflation of continuous use respirator interventions and respirator interventions that involved donning the respirator after already having breathed shared air that may contain infectious respiratory aerosols exhaled by patients or indeed workers or family is not justified. In the words of the Cochrane Handbook, differences in intervention characteristics across studies occur in all reviews. In general, differences that alter decisions about how an intervention is implemented or whether the intervention is used or not are likely to be important. The conflation of targeted and continuous use of respirators reflects a heavy reliance by HICPAC on the outdated model of transmission through either large ballistic droplets or small aerosols. More broadly, HICPAC's decision to engage with only probabilistic evidence from randomized controlled trials is not justified and doesn't comport with the EBM plus approach, which tells us that, quote, evidence of mechanisms should be integrated with evidence of correlation to better assess causal and to the claims. Extent that HICPAC and to the extent that HICPAC is concerned about the acceptability of other interventions, to reduce, and other interventions to reduce through the air transmission, you could and should commission realist reviews to learn what works how, why, for whom, to what extent, and in what circumstances. Second, my real-world experience with transmission of disease through the air in a healthcare setting. I care for an elderly person who is vibrant and engaged in the community who also has comorbidities and disabilities. Where she got COVID is impossible to say for sure, but it was likely during an outpatient visit to a physician at a health system whose infection prevention program is led by a HICPAC member whom I won't name. Nosocomial cases like hers exist. They are not detected by surveillance programs to the extent that surveillance still exists at all, but they have negative effects on patients' health and on patients' willingness to seek care for other conditions. The Isolation Precautions Guideline Workgroup's final list of shared interest says that the workgroup wants to, quote, protect patients and healthcare personnel from infection that is transmitted via infectious particles in the air. But I fear that your responses to the CDC letter will not reflect that goal. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Kate. We're going to move on to our next commenter. Maeve Sherry. Maeve, are you unmuted? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, good morning. My name is Maeve Sherry, representing the organization Panendit, and I'm a long COVID patient from Albany, New York. I'm providing public comment today because it concerns me how many decisions around airborne disease precautions are constructed around staffing and employee comfort rather than protecting patients. I've had long COVID since 2020. In 2023, the year that universal ma masking mandates were lifted in healthcare, I acquired a reinfection at a primary care doctor appointment. I developed mast cell activation syndrome and have become allergic to all foods. I've needed emergency health care repeatedly for severe allergic reactions, dehydration, and malnutrition due to this condition, and I have often gone without care because I couldn't justify the risk of another infection. Requiring that healthcare workers wear masks upon request only is not sufficient. I was masked, my primary care doctor was masked, but since COVID is airborne, the transmission was likely from a patient who was in the room earlier in the day. I was a 22-year-old kickboxing instructor when I became disabled from long COVID, and to all of you unmasked faces I saw on the other side of my screen earlier, I ask, if it could happen to me, why do you think it won't happen to you? Why do you think it won't happen and hasn't already happened to the healthcare workers who are exposed to COVID every single day without PPE? What would it take for you to link staffing concerns to the reality that healthcare workers are getting COVID multiple times a year and not always recovering? What would it take for you to reckon with the likelihood that someday you or someone you love will need emergency health care and a COVID HAI might be the reason you leave in a body bag? In 1850, a European doctor suggested that healthcare workers wash their hands in between patients because he su suspected that physicians were transmitting diseases. He was ridiculed, ignored, and ultimately died in a mental institution. 
It was decades before mainstream medicine finally conceded that he was right and implemented hand washing mandates in healthcare. Now it would be unfathomable for a physician not to wash their hands. Someday, physicians not masking will be regarded in the same way. You have control of how many patients need to die before that becomes the standard. These ascientific decisions around airborne disease precautions shape the future that will confront you and your family someday. You may be disinterested in preventing COVID, but COVID is not disinterested in you. When you say that masking is optional, you say that patients have the onus of preventing infection rather than the people whose jobs it is to ensure our safety. When you say that healthcare workers will only mask upon request, you open up patients to hostility and harassment. We have been working overtime to protect ourselves in healthcare. It's your turn. Thank you for your comment. We can move on to our next commenter. Naomi Baryam. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Naomi Baryam and I'm with the World Health Network. I hold a PhD in social policy and have worked for many years in maternal and child health, focusing on improving outcomes for our most vulnerable, including preterm babies. As the founder and executive director now emerita of Mother's Milk Bank Northeast, I have dedicated my career to ensuring the health and safety of newborns and their families. Over the past year, I have attended and followed HICPAC's proceedings on isolation precautions, and I've been deeply disheartened by the lack of scientific rigor, transparency, and expertise in airborne transmission on this committee, which is charged with creating guidelines that healthcare settings across the country rely upon. At, at each meeting, however, I have been profoundly moved and buoyed by the community of commentators. They have eloquently shared their expertise, lived experience, wisdom, pain, and compassion. It has become clear that HICPAC has its own set of considerations and priorities. Unfortunately, protecting the public and healthcare workers is getting lost in other considerations and does not seem to be at the top of that list. I understand that healthcare is complex and expensive with seemingly infinite competing priorities. But that is the challenge for the hospitals and healthcare institutions, including those where many of you work, to solve within the essential imperative of caring for pa patients' health and ensuring the safety of healthcare workers. Those institutions look to HICPAC to provide up-to-date, accurate, evidence-based scientific guidelines. These guidelines should empower them to make sound decisions that protect their patients, healthcare providers, and staff. Each of you on this committee wears multiple professional hats. Some of you are administrators and leaders in some of the most esteemed healthcare institutions in the country. While your knowledge and institutional roles bring value to this committee, they also present a challenge. You must separate your institutional priorities from your role on HICPAC. Your task is to provide the best safety guidelines for healthcare institutions everywhere so that those institutions, including yours in your other roles, can make decisions rooted in science. I urge you to do two things. First, step back and set aside your institutional roles. Focus instead on your HICPAC responsibility to healthcare facilities, patients, and providers across the country. And two, reflect on the gaps in this group's collective knowledge. Identify what expertise is missing, particularly in airborne transmission science, to ensure that HICPAC brings in the necessary voices to support the development of the most effective evidence-based recommendations possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Naomi. We can move on to our last commenter. Scott Squires. Hello, I'm Scott Squires. I have no conflict of interest. COVID is a terrible disease that can lead to long COVID and death. Fortunately, it can be prevented with respiratory mask. It's been clearly established that COVID is airborne. It acts like invisible smoke that can hang in the air for hours. This is true for all airborne illnesses. Simply breathing produces over 1,000 copies of the virus every minute. It is not spread as droplets. 
60% of those with COVID don't know they have it and are spreading it. The notion of using fever or symptoms alone to determine if someone or, or yourself has COVID is of little value. N95 respirator masks are designed specifically to prevent tiny airborne particles, including viruses like COVID, from being breathed in or breathed out. It's proven science, and numerous real studies confirm the effectiveness of N95 masks to prevent COVID in real-world examples, including hospitals. Even an unfitted N95 is at least 85% effective. Surgical masks are designed to prevent splatter. They are not designed to prevent airborne illnesses, and their effectiveness is much inferior to real respiratory masks. Lo looseness of surgical mask not only allows the air to easily leak out the sides, but also have the tendency to droop below the nose and encourage users to pull them down below their mouth, as is commonly seen by healthcare workers. That makes them worthless. What I'm puzzled about is what is the objective of this committee? Because based on the discussions and preliminary votes, it has nothing to do with preventing healthcare workers or patients and protecting them. Science and facts such as asymptomatic spread have been ignored. You voted no on the question, should NN95 respirators be recommended for all pathogens spread by air? And you ignore N95 at every opportunity where airborne is discussed. There's a saying, use the right tool for the right job, yet you are choosing to use the wrong tool, the inferior tool for protection. That's like not using an airbag and seat belts in a car, which are proven to save lives, and replace them with a foam pillow and a piece of rope in the hope it might provide some protection. The idea that healthcare workers can evaluate whether they need to mask and what type is silly. COVID is always here because it's not seasonal. As long as you have many untested people, there will be COVID. The vaccine alone does not prevent COVID or long COVID. Those looking for care should not be subjected to a deadly virus in healthcare settings. We need universal masking in hospitals and medical facilities, and they should always be required. Right now, we have hospitals switching masking on and off willy-nilly. We need the latest air standards to protect people. We need to stop sending infected healthcare workers back to spread COVID. Do your part to prevent the next pandemic. Thank you for your comment. And we appreciate all those who are able to make an oral public comment today or written. I would like to pass it back to our chair, Michael Lynn. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments. I think we will go ahead and take a brief break in order to load slides. We'll make it 10 minutes and we'll come back when we're ready. Thank you.